Okay, how many of you still drive this way? <laughs> there are people in New York who do, by the way, because they can't ever see beyond the next car. Point is, at a certain point, you figure out, you know, if I stare down the road some, I can see things and I can do corrective actions. Driving is a state of constant correction, right? Based on feedback that you get from your eyes, your ears, in some cases, your sense of touch. I don't know if it's popular here in Europe, but in the States, we have these little round dots raised that we put on the freeway so that if you start to veer out of your lane, you start hearing, right? And that way you get that tactile sense. It's so that we can let blind people drive. <laughs> you laugh. I've, I've, I live there. Trust me. I know what it's like. Point is, feedback is a critical part of any process. And if the language designer doesn't have that feedback, if he doesn't know that using this language works well except in these particular areas, or using this language only works well in these particular areas, then he has no feedback loop. He has no ability to make that language better. That feedback loop is effectively broken because when he gets that feedback, he takes your feedback and he puts it into the next version of the language and that makes it better so that somebody else is interested in using the language who then takes the language and says, oh yeah, this is really cool, except it would be nice if at which point he goes back and revises it again and again and again and again until eventually the language is something that everybody can find useful and suddenly life is better. Without us using his stuff, he can't figure out where the warts are so they can't be fixed so that other people won't use it. Consider this for just a second. How long ago were objects first introduced into programming languages? What was the first quote-unquote object language? Simula? You sure about that? Have you used it? No, but you're pretty sure of it anyway? When was Simula created? Small talk comes a little bit after Simula, but they're at about the same time. 1960-something, late 60s. When did objects first become popular, mainstream? something that we use in terms of business applications. It's not until Bjarne Strustrup, with his C with classes, with his attempt to take Simula and combine it with C, and even then, it's not until the early 90s, at, the, at, at best, that we start to see objects really sort of emerging into the mainstream. Now, granted, somebody in this room has probably used Smalltalk, and we'll probably say, oh, no, 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 Smalltalk's been around since the 70s, Alan Kay, and I was using Smalltalk on projects, you know, and he's, he's probably, you know, he's probably old, <laughs> right? And it's probably, you know, Smalltalk, he thinks, is the perfect language, and he's like the only guy in the room, right? Yes, Smalltalk's been around for years and years and years. There have been lots of object languages that have been around for years and years and years, but they didn't hit mainstream. They didn't become popular until C++. At which point, a bunch of people went off and learned Smalltalk because learning Smalltalk will teach you how to write good C++ code, right? We look at that and we laugh now because the languages are so obviously strikingly dissimilar Yes, they both use objects, but that's about the only thing that's similar there, right? That's kind of like saying if you want to learn Polish, you should go to the great, you know, great Britain and learn how they do things because, you know, they're both in Europe, right? Point is, it takes, let's assume 1965 is when Simula first emerges, and let's assume 1990 is when C++ is created. That's 25 years before objects hit the mainstream. And then we have Java. Java first becomes available in 1995. By 1998, Java is the mainstream business programming language. It has, for all intents and purposes, supplanted COBOL. Java is the COBOL of the 21st century. Doesn't that make you feel good? We should call this, you know, COBOL Developer Days. How does that, how does that, does that <laughs> fill you with... There's people down in the front row going, that's it, I'm out of here. 
I'm not working with this COBOL stuff. Point is, it took 25 years for objects to really hit the mainstream because it took that long for us to really sort of feed back into the system to sort of decide, yeah, this, and even now, today, if you talk to Ruby guys versus Java guys and C++ guys, dynamic versus static typing, we're still not quite sure how best to do objects, but you know, we're pretty sure that objects were, you know, the way to do things, right? There are four things going on right now in the world that are coming together in what uh, in what meteorologists call a perfect storm. Did you guys ever see that movie? George Clooney and Marky Mark, right? The idea that, you know, there's these different weather systems converging to create this absolutely monstrous storm that just, you know, drowns fishing boats and all this kinds of stuff. These four forces are coming together in very interesting ways to create this, this environment in which languages are going to be the thing that we work with over the next n number of years. The first is virtualization. How many of you did any sort of native programming code? C++, C, maybe some object Pascal, Delphi? None of you? Oh, okay, yeah. There's, everyone's everyone's kind of like, <laughs> I, I don't want to admit it, man. Come on. I was young. I needed the money. Come on. I... <laughs> How many of you have had to worry about the size of an int recently? How many of you had to worry about the endianness of the int? Which was the high bit? Which was the low bit? How many of you had to worry about having to exchange this, the, these binary data files that, reside, that, that rest on the size of an int and the order of an int? as you're exchanging them across platforms. When's the last time you had to worry about that? See, this is the beautiful thing about the Java Virtual Machine. It acts as a virtualization platform so that we, the developers, don't have to worry about that low-level stuff. When's the last time you had to worry about memory management? Oh yes, I must remember to delete all of the objects I knew. Right? I mean, there are C++ programmers who are still going through therapy to try to get through all of that. Doc, all I see are bad pointers. Oh, it's a terrible nightmare. Here, have some more drugs. That's how we solve problems in the States, have more drugs. Virtualization allows us to eliminate these low-level details. We don't have to worry about those low-level problems. We let the JVM deal with memory management. Now, there's still issues with resource management. We still have to figure out, you know, okay, we need to close our result sets. We need to make sure they get closed. If we wait for the garbage collector, that will be too long. It's not perfect. There are still some low-level details that we have to worry about. But realistically speaking, compared to our C++ compatriots, the JVM just takes care of this huge amount of stuff that we don't have to. Even something so simple as serialization to walk up to an object and turn it into an array of bytes. This is huge. This is powerful. I remember trying to do exactly this in C++. This was when, when I came over to Java, 95, I start playing with the JVM and I start talking with, uh, 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 playing with JVM one, uh, JDK 1.1 beta. And I start talking with some of the guys working on this stuff and I realize, oh my god, the, 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 the interesting parts of Java have nothing to do with the language. The language is like a crippled C++. That's not interesting. The interesting part is this virtual machine that has full access to all of the fields of a given object. The fact that it knows that this blob in memory is an object. This is powerful stuff. It means that I don't have to worry about creating those serialization libraries myself and we'll use that library to enable things like remote method invocation which in turn will be the backbone on which your app servers, your EJB servers will rest. We'll use things like class loaders, the ability to load multiple versions of the same class into the same VM while the system is still running. This is the backbone of the app server to be able to do things like hot deployment and versioning. This is powerful stuff. And you, the Java developer, don't have to worry about any of it. That same virtualization aspect of the JVM makes it easier for the language designer as well because he doesn't have to worry about any of that stuff. 